Community Focused Breastfeeding Support. This is a third year breastfeeding session of the pre-registration midwifery programmes. The aims of this session are to enable the student to increase their knowledge and skills to effectively support breastfeeding throughout the postnatal period, to critically evaluate the evidence base around community-based support, and to appreciate available legislation and codes relating to formula milk advertising and sponsorship. As you can see, the breastfeeding initiation rates are increasing, as are the continuation rates, but it can be seen that there is still a large drop-off rate where the midwife in her role in supporting breastfeeding still has lots of work still to do. Exclusive breastfeeding rates at six months remain low. How do the rates compare in Leicester and Leicestershire? How does Leicester and Leicestershire rate when compared to other counties in the East Midlands? See if you can find out how the statistics relating to England and the UK compare to local rates for Leicester, Leicestershire and the East Midlands. Locally, around 40% of women are totally breastfeeding and around 60% are partially breastfeeding at the six to eight week check. The health visitor collects statistics from the six to eight weeks neonatal check from all the PCTs every quarter. But see what you can find out locally. So why do women give up breastfeeding? There are lots of reasons. Common reasons include the baby would not take the breast, painful breasts and insufficient milk supply. Higher problems are seen in women who were supplementing with bottles or formula and those who were not receiving support were more likely to stop breastfeeding. This is from the Infant Feeding Survey 2010, the early results which were published in 2012. From a breastfeeding support perspective, consider what community-based strategies you feel are important to enable women to breastfeed for as long as they want to. Perhaps jot down some bullet points and be prepared to feed back and discuss with, with your peers and your mentors while out on community-based placements. Breastfeeding management is all around prevention because prevention is better than the cure. Many breastfeeding women experience physical problems while breastfeeding. So advice and support about positioning and attachment is always needed. Even if the woman's had children before and may have breastfed before, this is a new baby, a new situation. So advice and support around positioning and attachment is always required. The aim of all breastfeeding management is to encourage an adequate lactation in the mother and to enable the baby to receive breast milk. A sort of two-pronged attack, if you like. Early advice and support using evidence-based support is essential for successful breast breastfeeding. A lot of the evidence-based supports this. Stress increases the likelihood of cessation of breastfeeding. So it's really important that the midwife addresses the psychosocial aspects of breastfeeding and early motherhood. Early identification of maternal depression may increase the duration of breastfeeding. And we need to evaluate the effects of the systems of postnatal care um, that we have currently um, within the UK. UNICEF and the Breastfeeding Initiative Standards were reviewed. The full standards can be downloaded from the Baby Friendly website that looks at additions and changes, which include focusing on promoting close and loving relationships between the mother and her infant, valuing meaningful and helpful antenatal conversations with healthcare professionals, and responsive feeding patterns. Breastfeeding can be used to feed, comfort and calm a baby, not just give the baby nourishment. Support for bottle feeding mothers, and valuing any breastfeeding, however short. Breastfeeding care pathways were introduced by the Department of Health in 2010. These reflect and are linked to best practice guidelines from UNICEF and the World Health Organization. And these are important for achieving baby friendly. 
and they consist of three pathways, one for the antenatal period, one for the immediate postnatal period in hospital and one for community postnatal care. So how would you incorporate these into your practice? So I suggest you download them from the Department of Health website and look at them in detail. Maternal breastfeeding difficulties need a full breastfeeding history and observation of a feed to ensure that the mother gets the correct advice. Again, advice about positioning attachment is always needed to ensure an effective breastfeeding technique. And most of the breastfeeding difficulties experienced by mothers need positioning attachment and they, that may be all that's needed to improve the situation. Saw and crack nipples respond to a review of the mother's positioning and attachment technique to relieve any nipple trauma, increase effective removal of milk from the breasts by the baby and increase the milk supply. Also consider application of express breast milk after the feed and the careful use of nipple shields, just occasionally for the odd feed to um, encourage the mother to carry on breastfeeding, but not on a long-term use. Engorged breasts may respond to hand expression to relieve the engorgement, which then enables the baby to attach to the breasts effectively. Again, good advice and support around positioning attachment to enable the baby to feed effectively. Warm baths to stimulate the oxytocin reflex and also a neck and back massage has also been shown to be useful. After feeding, a cold compress may reduce the edema, chilled ice packs, cabbage leaves, all of these are soothing. And simple analgesia such as paracetamol can be given. Block ducts may respond to a change of position, a change of clothing, um, such as a tight bra will block a duct, so ensure the woman has a correct, well-fitting bra. Gentle massage of the effective duct during feeding and warm compresses will help to encourage the milk to flow. Observe for signs of mastitis, especially if there's been trauma to the, trauma to the nipple, which may allow bacteria to enter the breast and cause mastitis. Observe for signs of candida infection. Pain, often described as burning, felt on feeding, and the pain may shoot deep into the breast. The skin of the areola may be red, shiny and flaky, although there may be nothing to see on the skin. Avoid the use of dummies. If, you're going to, if the mother's going to use these, they need to be sterilised carefully. And check the baby for signs of oral or nappy area thrush. And you need to treat the mum and the baby together. Antifungals are, are usually given, such as nystatin. These need to be prescribed by the GP and the mother and the baby need treating as one. So how would you recognise that a baby was effectively feeding? Consider signs of neonatal well-being, consider signs of effective attachment and consider feeding patterns that promote effective breastfeeding. Here is a few scenarios. Scenario 1. Katie and her new baby are on your caseload. Katie has been breastfeeding her three-week-old son Alex from birth and has experienced few problems so far. She contacts you to report that she feels that her milk supply is diminishing. What can you do to help? Diagnosis of insufficient milk supply. Reliable indicators include poor weight gain and passing small amounts of concentrated urine. We know babies should pass at least six to eight wet nappies per day. So that in itself is an indicator that the baby is not getting sufficient milk. Causes are variable, often include such things as infrequent feeding patterns, scheduled feeds, trying to get the baby to feed every three to four hours. No night feeds, so perhaps the mother's gone back to work and she's trying to reduce the amount of, of um, night feeds that the baby has. 
short feeds. Perhaps she's very busy. She's got other children to look after. Thinks, well, the baby's had a few minutes. That'll do for now. And takes the baby off the breast. Poor attachment. Use of bottles and dummies. Use of supplementary feeds. All of these lead to insufficient milk supply. There may be some social reasons. Perhaps the mother's experiencing stress and worry. Perhaps she dislikes breastfeeding. Perhaps she's rejecting the baby. Physiologically, perhaps that she's been prescribed the oral contraceptive pill rather than the mini pill, and the oestrogen within that is affecting her milk supply. She may have become pregnant, and while that is not um, doesn't mean that she has to stop breastfeeding, it may affect her milk supply, at least temporarily. A poor diet, alcohol, smoking poor breast development, although the latter is, is quite rare. And the baby may be ill. There may be some issues with the baby from illness um, or ill health or even abnormality. Management includes a full breastfeeding history, observation of the feed, and it may be that reassurance is all that's needed. Again, give advice and support to ensure effective positioning and attachment of the baby to the breast and encourage the mother to feed frequently. Advise her that this should be baby-led. Suggest hand expression in between feeds, perhaps even the use of a breastfeeding supplementer. Stop any supplementary feeds and the use of dummies. Perhaps start or reintroduce night feeds. Give advice to the woman about diet and fluid intake, rest and relaxation. And even consider persistent oversupply, where there's a high volume, low fat feeds, which the baby isn't getting the hind milk. And perhaps by expressing the breasts initially before a feed, the baby doesn't get so much of the fore milk and then has room to take the hind milk, which is, is rich in, in nutrients and will keep the baby satisfied for longer. Scenario two, Evelyn and her new baby are on your caseload. Evelyn's daughter Rosie is less than 24 hours old, but every time Evelyn or the midwife tries to help Rosie attach to the breast, she screams, arches her back and refuses to go anywhere near the breast. Evelyn was keen to breastfeed antenatally, but is now thinking that Rosie might be better on formula milk. What can you do to help? The definition of breast ref refusal is the baby who refuses to feed from the breast. Causes are variable. The baby may be ill, maybe have a blocked nose, and we know babies breathe through the nose so they won't be able to, to maintain that attachment on the breast. Perhaps the baby's in pain. Perhaps it's having got candida in its mouth or it's been sedated, so it's not keen to go to the breast. There may be problems with the breastfeeding technique. Perhaps the baby's been forced onto the breast and the baby's you know, un unhappy because it's not able to get at the right position at the breast. The mother's going to be upset and she's going to find it difficult to relax. She's going to perhaps take it personally and feels the baby's refusing or rejecting her rather than having problems feeding. And it may be that the baby's got used to bottles and dummies, which is a completely different um, technique for feeding and so then doesn't want to go to the breast. Management includes treating any illnesses, treating any problems in the mother or the baby and again giving advice and support to ensure effective positioning and attachment of the baby to the breast. Offering the breast frequently but not worrying too much if the baby still refuses to go to the breast because as we said before Breastfeeding is initiation and maintenance of lactation, but also getting milk into the baby from a nutritional perspective. So offering the best breast frequently, even if the baby doesn't take the breast, hand express to initiate the lactation and maintain lactation. This helps to enable the lactation to occur, and then we can cup feed the baby any express breast milk to ensure that the baby is receiving the breast milk. Keep offering the baby the breast and eventually 
through experience, I've, I've noticed that babies will eventually go on to the breast. It takes time, it takes patience, and keeping that mum motivated and supported through this time can be um, difficult. Scenario three. Bobby and her new baby are on your caseload. Bobby is a young mother of 19 years and because of peer pressure, had decided not to breastfeed her daughter Kylie. However, she likes skin to skin and finds that Kylie nuzzles into her breasts and asks you whether she could breastfeed after all, even though Kylie is now 14 days old. What can you do to help? If a mother has stopped breastfeeding, she may wish to start again. It's possible even months or years later, and especially as this, this scenario, this baby is only a couple of weeks old, it shouldn't really be a problem with support and correct management. If the woman's never been pregnant, this is called induced lactation rather than relactation, and techniques are useful for increasing the milk supply for all women. There's two methods of relactation. One of them is mechanical, use of expression via pump or hand expression. Medication, use of such drugs as metoclopramide, um, usually used in cases of induced lactation. It is easier to relactate if the baby is less than two months old. The baby isn't too used to feeding from the bottle and the baby stopped breastfeeding recently. The management includes putting the baby to the breast every two hours, letting the baby suckle freely, giving formula milk by cup or spoon while the milk supply is increasing, providing extra stimulation by use of breast pump, and eventually breast milk can be expressed around about 10, five to 10 days, but an adequate milk supply may take up to six weeks. So again, it's time consuming for the mother and needs continued support by the midwife. It's not impossible. Scenario four, Alice's baby Abigail is now eight weeks old and Alice has to return to full-time work in around four weeks time. She's a financial administrator and is keen to continue breastfeeding for as long as possible. She asks for your advice. What can you do to help? Returning to work needs preparation. So it's important that the woman prepares to return to work way before she actually needs to. She may have had some idea that she wants to, to go back to work once the baby was born, but a lot of women change their mind actually to, to when and what time, depending on, on, on the baby and their financial circumstances. There's also the role of the employer to consider, and they need to be thinking about risk assessments not just because she's breastfeeding, but because she's just had a baby. And there are laws and guidelines for employers and employees, including the expressing and storing of breast milk for those that wish to breastfeed. So again, if you're caring for women on a caseload and you're having an extended caseload for up to six, six to eight weeks postpartum, you need to know what laws and guidance there is for employers and employees to ensure that you give the correct advice to women. UNICEF recommend introducing other foods at around six months. This is called weaning. And while this is a little bit out of our remit as midwives and more of the role of the health visitor, we might be asked our advice around breastfeeding and continuation of breastfeeding. The general rule is that babies should not receive any other food or drinks unless medically indicated while they're breastfeeding. But we need to know the difference between supplementary feeds and complementary feeds. So make sure you know that difference because there is a difference. And breastfeeding should continue up to two years or beyond. And we can encourage women to breastfeed into infancy, but you need to consider your values and beliefs that influence when you think a woman should stop breastfeeding. For instance, how would you react or how would you feel 
if a woman said that she was still breastfeeding her school-aged child, for example? What sort of a reaction are you going to give? What sort of advice are you going to give? Remember, midwives should be non-judgmental and supportive. But our values and attitudes um, are very much influential, especially around these issues. So that's something you need to have a think about. There are lots of codes and legislation that support breastfeeding. The two main ones are the World Health Organization International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes, published in 1981, and the World Health Organization Infant Formula and Follow-on Formula Regulations, which were published in 1995. So what I advise you to do is access these codes of practice and look at how they support breastfeeding. How do they influence both midwifery practice and the maternity services? I'd like to talk a little bit now about advertising and sponsorship from formula milk companies and how that might influence breastfeeding rates, breastfeeding success and our role. So consider this scenario, which I've come across several times. For instance, you see an advert for a study day on obesity, not connected to breastfeeding anyway, which is free. And as you're on a day off, you decide you'd like to go. When completing the online application form, however, you notice it's sponsored by a well-known formula milk company. Do you still go? Vote now. Have a think of your initial reaction to that. Would you actually go? You need to consider certain perspectives before you make your mind up. So consider the following questions. Do you feel promotion of infant formula milk by formula milk companies undermines your role? You need to consider why marketing is important and consider how individuals are influenced by advertising. Advertising's big business. We all watch adverts on the television, listen to them on the radio. Why do companies spend such a lot of money marketing their products? Do you recommend brands to women? You probably don't say choose SMA, choose Cow and Gate because of what you've heard and, and read and been subjected to through advertising. You probably feel you don't actually, you're not actually influenced by these adverts and marketing. But you probably are because if you think about the most commonly marketed milk companies such as SMA or Cow and Gate, they're often the ones that are on television most and they're the, probably the ones that's going to come into your head if a woman says, what milk brands are there. So consider how you support women who choose to formula feed their babies and think about it from a marketing perspective. There's also been a really good paper brought out by UNICEF just this year called A Guide for Health Workers to Working Within the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes. So this was produced by UNICEF in 2013, so this, this year. Look at the narratives on page 10 to 11 which really does explain the effect of marketing of breast milk substitutes and the effects it has on midwife's practice. So have a look at that, read the scenario again, and then decide whether you would now attend that study day sponsored by this formula milk company. So to conclude, support from midwives, other healthcare professionals and other agencies are very important to promote successful breastfeeding. Midwives need to be aware of how they are influenced by the marketing of formula milk products.